During reading activity, as you read the story, look for the elements of a narrative, theme, characters, plot, and setting, and notice the impact of the dialogue and dialogue tags on the story and the characters. The story has been broken down into manageable reading chunks, followed by questions. Answer the questions in complete sentences using evidence from the text as needed. At the end of the questions, complete the after reading activity chart. From Kefir Boy by Mark Marabani. About the author. Mark Marabani was born in South Africa, just outside of Johannesburg. He spent his childhood in an unheated shack with no electricity and no running water. Marabani and his family lived in fear of the police who enforced the law of apartheid a segregated political system, sometimes violently. In 1978, Marabane secured a tennis scholarship to a college in South Carolina. He later graduated from Dowling College in New York. During his writing career, Marabane has produced several works of nonfiction, as well as three recent novels. Kafir Boy is Marabane's story of his childhood, living under apartheid. When my mother began dropping hints, that I would soon be going to school, I vowed never to go because school was a waste of time. She laughed and said, we'll see. You don't know what you're talking about. My philosophy on school was that of a gang of 10, 11, and 12 year olds whom I so revered that their every word seemed that of an oracle. These boys had long left their homes and were now living in various neighborhood junkyards, making it on their own. They slept in abandoned cars, smoked glue and benzene, ate pilchards and brown bread, sneaked into the white world to caddy, and, if unsuccessful, came back to the township to steal beer and soda bottles from she bins or goods from the Indian traders on First Avenue. Their lifestyle was exciting, adventurous, and full of surprises, and I was attracted to it. My mother told me that they were no-gooders, that they would amount to nothing, that I should not associate with them, but I paid no heed. What does she know? I used to tell myself. One thing she did not know was that the gang's way of life had captivated me wholly, particularly their philosophy on school. They hated it and considered it an education a waste of time. They, like myself, had grown up in an environment where the value of an education was never emphasized, where the first thing a child learned was not how to read and write and spell, but how to fight and steal and rebel. Where the money to send children to school was grossly lacking for survival was first priority. I kept my membership in the gang, knowing that for as long as I was under its influence, I would never go to school. One day, my mother woke me up at four in the morning. Are they here? I didn't hear any noises, I asked in the usual way. No, my mother said. I want you to get into that wash tub over there. What? I balked upon hearing the word wash tub. I feared taking baths like one feared the plague. Throughout seven years of hectic living, the number of baths I had taken could be counted on one hand with several fingers missing. I simply had no natural inclination for water. Cleanliness was a trait I still had to acquire. Besides, we had only one bathtub in the house and it constantly sprung a leak. Stop reading here and answer the first question. Continue reading here. I said, get into that tub. My mother shook her finger in my face. Reluctantly, I obeyed, yet wondered why all of a sudden I had to take a bath. My mother, armed with a scrap brush and a piece of life boy soap, purged me of years and years of grime till I ached and bled. As I howled, feeling pain shoot through my limbs, as the thistles of the brush encountered stubborn calluses, there was a loud knock at the door. Instantly, my mother leaped away from the tub and headed on tiptoe toward the bedroom. Fear seized me as I, too, thought of the police. I sat frozen in the bathtub, not knowing what to do. Open up, Mujaji, my mother's maiden name. Granny's voice came shrilling through the door. It's me. My mother heaved a sigh of relief. Her tense limbs relaxed. She turned and headed to the kitchen door, unlatched it, and in came Granny and Aunt Bushy. You scared me half to death, my mother said to Granny. I had forgotten all about your coming. Are you ready? Granny asked my mother. Yes, just about, my mother said, beckoning me to get out of the washtub. 
she handed me a piece of cloth to dry myself. As I dried myself, questions raced through my mind. What's going on? What's Granny doing at our house this ungodly hour of the morning? And why did she ask my mother, Are you ready? While I stood debating, my mother went into the bedroom and came out with a stained white shirt and a pair of faded black shorts. Here, she said, handing me the togs. Put these on. Why? I asked. Put them on, I said. I put the shirt on. It was grossly loose-fitting. It reached all the way down to my ankles. Then I saw the reason why. It was my father's shirt. But this is Papa's shirt, I complained. It don't fit me. Put it on, my mother insisted. I'll make it fit. The pants don't fit me either, I said. Whose are they anyway? Put them on, my mother said. I'll make them fit. Moments later, I had the garments on. I looked ridiculous. My mother started working on the pants and shirt to make them fit. She folded the shirt in so many intricate ways and stashed it inside the pants, they too having been folded several times at the waist. She then chopped the pants at the waist with a piece of sisal rope to hold them up. She then lavishly smeared my face, arms and legs with a mixture of pig's fat and Vaseline. This will insulate you from the cold, she said. My skin gleamed like the morning star, and I felt as hot as the center of the sun and smelled God knows like what. After embalming me, she headed to the bedroom. Stop reading here and answer all the questions in number two. Continue reading here. Where are we going, Grandma? I said, hoping that she would tell me what my mother refused to tell me. I still had no idea I was about to be taken to school. Didn't your mother tell you, Granny said with a smile? You're going to start school. What? I gasped, leaping from the chair where I was sitting as if it were made of hot lead. I am not going to school, I blurted out and raced towards the kitchen door. My mother had just reappeared from the bedroom and guessing what I was up to. She yelled, Someone get the door! Aunt Bushy immediately barred the door. I turned and headed for the window. As I leaped for the windowsill, my mother lunged at me and brought me down. I tussled. Let go of me. I don't want to go to school. Let me go. But my mother held fast onto me. It's no use now, she said, grinning triumphantly as she pinned me down. Turning her head in Granny's direction, she shouted, Granny, get a rope, quickly. Granny grabbed a piece of rope nearby and came to my mother's aid. I bit and clawed every hand that grabbed me and held protestations against going to school. However, I was no match for the two determined matriarchs. In a jiffy, they had me bound, hand and feet. What's the matter with him? Granny bewildered asked my mother. Why did he suddenly turn into an imp when I told him you're taking him to school? You shouldn't have told him that he's being taken to school, my mother said. He doesn't want to go there. That's why I requested you come today, to help me take him there. Those boys in the streets have been a bad influence on him. As the two matriarchs hauled me through the door, they told Aunt Bushy not to go to school, but stay behind and mind the house and the children. Stop reading here and answer question three, and then proceed to the after reading activity.